So, uh, because uh, we are running out of time now, because we just started a little, uh, little bit late, I'm going to introduce the first keynote speaker of today, and we're going to start with the conference. So, today we're going to start with uh, Mandy Rose. So, Mandy Rose is Associate Professor and Director of the University of the West of England's Digital Cultural Research Centre. Her practice-based research looks at the intersection between documentary and networked culture. Mandy is a contributing editor to IDOX and co-convenor of 2014 IDOX Symposium. Mandy's recent writing appears in the Journal of Documentary Studies, the Documentary Film Book, and Do It Yourself, Citizenship, Critical Making, and Social Media from MIT Press. Mandy blogs at Collab Docs, so it's a real pleasure to have Mandy here. Uh, she's a key player in the, inter in the interactive documentary field. So a big round of applause for Mandy, please. Thank you. Um, first to say thank you, Arnau, for the invitation to be here. It's terrific to be here. And it was great to hear last night something about the state of interactive documentary in Spain. It actually seems like it's a really interesting moment. Um, the thing that I would add to your introduction, Arnau, is that I'm also a practitioner of long standing. Um, I left the BBC probably three or three, three or four years ago now, um, having been there for 20 years, um, 15 of which I'd been the producer of a number of quite um, substantial participatory, sorry, participatory documentary projects. Um, and also, yeah, I see, sorry. Do I need to start again? Or do I have a loud enough voice to have reached you anyway? So yes, yeah, so um, how is this? Is this one on at the moment? Can, is, is that OK? Because actually, <clears throat> I don't know what you choose. Crowdsourcing the answer. Is it this one or this one? This one? OK, OK, fine. All right, so um, yeah, so. Just to add a little bit then, I, I was adding a little bit about my own background as, as a practitioner, and in particular my background in producing works which involve the public as makers. And so that's one of my particular interests as, as my um, blog and my Twitter handle at CollabDocs suggest. So that's the angle I'm coming to for, for today. Um, and I'm going to speak with slides, but I wanted to kick off with some moving images. It seems kind of sacrilege not to do that in this context. So, to find a website, and then I'll explain why I'm, why I'm showing you this one. It's a current North American project called Question Bridge, which has been around for a couple of years and is now relaunched as a more interactive project. This may seem like a silly question, but I want to know, am I the only one when it's probably eating chicken, watermelon, and bananas in front of white people. So how do we learn to love our women when so many of us never had a man or our father in the house um, to show us by example how to love a woman? How come more of us don't surf? How does it feel to see someone lose their life? The question that I have is for my brothers that are incarcerated. I would like to know if during your incarceration, you feel as though you've become disconnected to loved ones, family, and those you had loyalties to on the outside world. And to be specific, I would like to know if you still value your community and have a sense of responsibility towards your community upon your release. That's my... Okay, so... Um, I'll escape from this and get into my presentation. Was 
is, is from design for participation to participatory design. And I guess what I'm pointing to, um, thinking about the Question Bridge project, which proceeds not in the traditional mode of documentary by asking questions of the people involved, but it proceeds from their questions. The whole project is structured so that actually those participants become subjects in the undertaking. The fact that it, it starts with what they're asking, not what they're telling. Um, they're kind of agents, very clearly agents in the process. So I guess, so my title, as I'll go on to suggest, has to do with something that I, I feel is going on, which is a shift from a preoccupation on the part of interactive documentary makers who are interested in working with the public in making content, a shift from designing to let people contribute into something a little more sophisticated and I think more interesting, which is designing around their needs, their interests, designing in a way that makes them the subjects of the documentaries in a slightly different way. So um, there's the Question Bridge project, as I said. Um, but to kind of cut back from, from now, to put some context around this, a quote from 2001. Uh, Lev Manovich's book, a really significant book for us still, written in 2001, The Language of New Media, was thinking, he was thinking in this book about what computer culture was going to mean for art and aesthetics in the 21st century. Um, thinking, interestingly, with reference to a documentary, Man with a Movie Camera, that was a particular point of reference in the book. But this particular quote interests me. I think it's still really kind of resonant this idea that computerization allows this opening up, um, opening up in all, in all sorts of aspects. And we can see this in documentary, in every aspect of production and, and beyond. Um, this opening up, and in particular, an opening up to the public, who are, in a sense, are our partners in documentary anyway. They have an interest in the, we hope, and we want, you know, the interest in the subjects that we're, that we're thinking about, that we're portraying. Um, but actually what we've seen in particular speeding up in the last five years is the opening up in all sorts of aspects of, of, of documentary production. So just to take a few examples, um, crowdfunding. Um, here's Kickstarter, and I know there are a couple of crowdfunding platforms here in, here in Spain. And this has become a very significant, a very significant field and something that you could think of as a kind of democratization of commissioning. Um, it's not an easy job crowdfunding your work. If any of you have tried it, you'll, you'll really know this. But on the other hand, there's a particular affinity between documentary and crowdfunding, and, and actually a, a between crowdfunding and film. So something like half the money that Kickstarter distributes, it distributes to film, and something like half of that goes into documentary. So it's actually very significant for us. Um, another example that I think is really interesting is open rights frameworks, the way that people's choices to share work through creative commons or other forms of open rights is, is a transformational possibility for us in documentary. This project, Global Lives, is a nice example of that. It goes back to 2004. Um, a North American, a project based in San Francisco, but which has had collaborators involved from all over the world. And through that broad collaboration, Global Lives have created 10 24-hour films about life on Earth, films designed to reflect the reality of life on Earth in terms of people's income, people's um, ages, religious um, affiliation. Um, and these 24-hour films are available to any, for anyone to reuse, to share, reuse. Um, so, for example, a film made about 24 hours in someone's life in Malawi has turned out to be the most um, precious resource about the, uh, the Chichewa language, the language of Malawi. There was no such resource before, and it's become something that's being used by linguists to start to build a corpus around the Chichewa language. So, these um, open rights projects have that um, capacity to, for unexpected results and unexpected impacts. Um, so 
Then at the heart of what's been going on, um, it's very much our subject today, is interactive documentary, which is an open form in the sense that it takes an act of co-creation to make an interactive documentary happen. You know, it takes someone clicking, moving through the experience. Um, the database, uh, you know, opens up to exploration through the active agency of the, of the user. Um, and that's being explored in lots of different ways, and we'll be hearing about some of them today. Um, but I just wanted to point to one example because I think there's something very interesting. So the, so the user, you know, there's co-creation act, you know, activity. The user is moving through a documentary, choosing a path very often, choosing a kind of way through the experience. But, but I guess one of the things I would point to in, in Bear 71 is something that I think is a particularly interesting feature of that and which we see in other projects, particularly uh, the Wilderness Downtown music video, is how producers are thinking about implicating the subject, not just as a in terms of clicking and choosing, but also more emotionally. So in Bear 71, when I um, explored the project and it asked me if it could use my webcam and I said yes, and then at and a certain point later in, in the experience, I suddenly realized that I was looking at myself on the screen, uh, that I was subject to the surveillance, which was one of the themes of the, of the project. And I could see, not in this image, that's me a couple of years ago, but I could see other people watching the project and I didn't quite know if they were watching it now or they were recorded from yesterday. So it really kind of evoked this emotional response, that way that I was implicated, that I was co-creating my own experience. So, um, as I said, I'm particularly interested in this kind of profound affordance of digital, which is the affordance which allows non-professionals, people often with little experience previously, of producing content to make content. Um, so, you know, we've got now cheap, accessible tools for making that, that mobile phone in your pocket, which is very likely to be uh, one that can record video. You know, we've got the web, which is an open platform. Um, uh, for exhibition, for distribution, and social media networks that allow us to connect between people around the world. I mean, any one of these potentials would be transformative for documentary. All coming at the same time, it's quite an extraordinary moment. Um, and I guess I'm interested in what happens as w if, when we as documentary makers really think about that possibility. If our interest is in telling stories about the world that we share and interrogating that world and asking if this is the world we want it to be and if not, what world we might like. This is just a very profound change. So just to kind of give a couple of examples of um, different approaches to participation, here's a still from Tiffany Schlein and the Moxie Institute's um, uh, cloud filmmaking uh, project, as they call it. There have been a number of iterations of this. So they're very interested in how you can work with a crowd across, around the world to make content. And they have an interesting model where they invite around particular themes and with particular, make very specific calls to action. And also they offer something back to the communities that they work with to make versions of, of, the, of the pieces, um, the short films that they make. So yes, cloud filmmaking, exploring the potential of global connectivity for documentary making. Um, perhaps the best example of participatory documentary, or rather, I, I should say, rather than best, the best known example um, is Life in a Day that came out three years, 2011, 2012? Yeah, one of those. Um, it's a kind of exemplar that people are aware of. And I know that that, girl in the top left hand corner I think was from this region. She was doing that pyramid, climbing up that pyramid, which is part of a festival. Anyway, I just noticed it on the telly last night that that festival was being shown. So, um, life in a day, but I guess to me there's a problem with life in a day. The, the problem with life in a day is that the relationship seems to be one way, that actually, you know, people very happy to take part and curious to take part, but you know, there were 80,000 contributions to Life in a Day. 
Um, and no one except the people in the editing room, you know, uh, got to decide what story was told. And, you know, if you look at that quote at the top there, an hour and a half of happiness, a terrific cinematic experience, you know, it's kind of interesting because that would be, to think about a, a day in the life, 24 hours or a life in the day of the world today, I think there are many, many people on this earth who would not say that that would be an hour and a half of happiness, actually for whom, you know, in a world that's kind of riven by all sorts of problems and inequality and you know, wars and, and difficulties for people that actually to portray life, in, you know, life on earth as something that just makes us smile is a quite a particular point of view. So, you know, so I guess I'm, I, 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 think, I think in a way the context for thinking about participation has changed now. The context has shifted. Um, the innately positive connotation that I think we all felt associated with participation has been thrown into question by things including um, the revelations about the National Security Agency in the US, um, but also by things about what we're learning about tracking, that it's the same social media that allow us to engage with each other, which also allow for tracking, for data mining our content, for targeting advertising ourselves. So I think, you know, we're at a moment where Something's shifting there, and we actually have to start thinking about that question, and in a sense then questioning participation, and thinking a little bit more about what the dynamics, what the politics of that is. Um, my colleague in Bristol, John Doby, um, talks about the extractive logic of the network, and I think that's the thing that we need to be thinking about now, and, and questioning in our practices, and asking what's the response to that for documentary? Um, so this takes me to a more kind of politicised definition of participation. Here's one from 1969. Um, uh, Sherry Arnstein, in the first sentence, really sets out quite clearly one, one agenda for participation, which is an explicitly political one, about the redistribution of power. If you want to get people involved, why? Why might be about um, that people exclu presently excluded from the political and economic processes can be included in the future. So I think this is a kind of interesting definition to think about at this point. Um, and the date's very relevant, 1969. So 1969, as we all know, a moment of great change, turmoil, the moment of civil rights, the rise of feminism, um, of Native American rights and the growing environmental consciousness, um, moment when you know students were on the streets in Paris and allied with the workers there. So it's an interesting moment, and in a way, I would suggest that we're now at another moment that's rather like that. Things are challenging for us. There's a lot. There's a lot of problems and issues we have to face. And back in 1969, media was part of that politics. Was part of what people were concerned about. And people were pressing to have their voices heard. So in Canada, it was the moment when um, the National Film Board um, in a, uh, had a project called Challenge for Change. And it was, it was, it was that year, 1969, when George Stoney, the director of the Challenge for Change project at the National Film Board, agreed with his team that they should hand over the cameras to Native American people who were protesting a bridge that had been put across their land that they were having to pay tolls on. So that's the kind of moment when we first saw a kind of articulated idea about documentary participation. Um, so, and there's George Stoney, another still from that project, You Are an Indian Land, which you can check out, it's, it's available online. So it's interesting that there's actually a direct line from this work back then to some of the work that's going on today. Um, in 2005, I think, the National Film Board of Canada contacted Katerina Szczesek and said to her, we want to know what it would look like if we had reinvented Challenge for Change for today. And she came on board initially with a project called um, Filmmaker in Residence. She um, embedded herself in a hospital in Toronto and, and carried out a number of experiments in what she called interventionist media. And then that project, um, out of that project came High Rise, a project I'm sure you're very familiar with, a project um, 
which looks at what the team have called global suburbanism, this um, extremely common experience around the world of life in high-rise buildings, often on the edge of the major cities. Um, and this project has proceeded through a number of years already and through a number of iterations, as you can see, as a close partnership and collaboration between some academics looking at that field, the media makers, and at the heart of it, some tenants, in high-rise tenants in Toronto, who inform the project, who are in constant dialogue with the project about, about what it's doing. And so one of the particular projects that's come out of that uh, relationship is one, one Millionth Tower, which um, portrays what happens when some tower block residents and architects work together to reimagine the spaces that those people live in. And this project, for example, was taken to City Hall, was discussed, you know, so these projects, they don't just kind of, they're not just made and shown, they're, they're produced in a dialogue which can be effective in, in the context of those people's lives. So, um, so a second example that I think is really interesting is um, a project um, by Elaine McMillian and colleagues. Um, Elaine returned to her childhood home, West Virginia. Um, in fact, the county adjacent to the county she grew up in, but I think it's very important that she uh, was making work about a place that she knew very well. She went back there to make a film about the depopulation of uh, post-industrial rural America. Um, there are many counties uh, in which, which, which are considered to be dying, where there are more people leaving than staying, and this was one of those counties, and she wanted to think about well, what happens to these places and the people who are in them. Um, what are those lives like? Um, so she went to make a film and gradually began to think that she couldn't make a film and then leave. She didn't want to do that kind of, you know, coming in, portraying things and then and then and then leaving. So instead she entered into a an iterative process of thinking and talking with people in McDowell County about their situations, their hopes and fears, and she ran workshops with them and made stories with people coming out of those workshops. Um, she, and actually one of, the, one of the core issues she discovered in talking to people, one of the core issues for them was the issue of representation. Uh, that actually people in McDowell County felt that the only times they heard about themselves in the media were stories of um, kind of stories of desperation, stories of victimhood, stories of drug addiction and you know and kind of despair and actually that was very undermining for people in terms of their own their self-image and, and their you know sense of themselves as agents in their own lives and destinies. So 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 as I say she worked with them to make stories and I would urge you, if you haven't, please take a look at this project because it's very, very beautiful. And the way that the kind of architecture of the project, the way those stories are embedded in a very kind of rich media landscape, which uh, it makes them feel, I, I don't know, has a very kind of precious um, feel and um, it's very suggestive of a place. So, um, also in uh, response to what people were saying in McDowell County, the team created um, a kind of community newspaper, which I meant to put a still on, but I haven't done, but you, you'll find it. it. It looks like a newspaper. It's a skewer morph of a newspaper. I like that word, skewer morph, and use it when I can. So it's like a digital representation of something that's analog. So this, this, um, this is a space where people can, can have an ongoing dialogue, can um, post things that they're up to, can uh, communicate, and that came out of those kind of conversations with the community. Um, and just I'll just point you to one little detail, which I think is quite sweet in terms of design and thoughtful design and care for the people involved. Can you see up there there's a little lock? There's a little lock that I couldn't manage to get a screen grab of close up. But it's what that lock is about is saying actually you don't get to see those photos in detail and find out more about Marcella until you've actually heard her story. 
And I just thought that was kind of really interesting and sort of nice little kind of detail about how one might be kind of true to, to a participant's concerns and somehow kind of, you know, um, push back on that whole idea that everything is open, you can have what you want, you can click here, you can click there, you can, you know, you can ignore the bits of the story you're not interested in. I thought it was kind of interesting, um, interesting design tactic. So, um, so in these kind of participatory projects, it's obviously really important to know something about what they look like from, from the point of view of the people taking part. And we don't know enough about this yet, and certainly it's something that I'm interested in doing some research on, plan to do some research on with some colleagues. But for now, I found some quotes from people in McDowell County. Um, there, was a there was a what the community is saying section in the development site that isn't actually there anymore, and I fished out some quotes. These were among about 10 which all had the same kind of feel to them. And I thought, think they're very interesting because, well, you can read them. This sense that you have from these quotes that people there did not feel that they had the possibility of having their voice heard without an intermediary, it comes across very clearly, you know, Millions almost kind of a saviour coming in. And actually what struck me about that, um, it struck me that these quotes were actually remarkably similar to some quotes that came out of uh, when a journalist talked to people who'd been involved in a BBC project that I was involved in 20 years ago. Um, but what seemed to me to be interesting about that was that, that actually that was 20 years ago. That was pre-digital or on the very early leading edge of digital. Whereas now we have this kind of you know, rhetoric of universal participation. We've all got the tools to make things in our pockets. We've all got access to the internet. But actually I think these quotes make it very clear that we haven't. And actually it's still the case that for many people Access may actually be there. It may not be a question of what we used to call the digital divide, that people haven't got the money to get online. You know, they could probably go to the local library if they haven't got Wi-Fi at home. But I think what this makes clear is that many people just don't feel part of this story. Just feel that, that it's not, you know, it's not accessible to them. Um, so actually, it, it, to me, it, it underlines the importance of these mediated projects. Um, as well as the importance for those producing them of thinking very carefully and deeply about what those relationships are producing. So, um, so I showed you a little bit of Question Bridge, um, a project um, by a team of, of artists um, and media makers, Kamal Sinclair, Hank Williams, um, Bayete Ross-Smith, and Chris Johnson, a project that actually comes out of the art world, but which then kind of meets documentary, and that's, that's not untypical at the moment. I, we, we're seeing quite a number of such projects. So the project sets out to challenge this kind of monolithic notion of, 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 of black male identity, and the racism that black men have been subject to, and the ways that that's impacted on their own identities in harmful ways, and ways that kind of put them in boxes. And I think, I hope that you saw, even through my clumsy bit of um, navigation through the site, something about the quality of kind of subjecthood that I think comes out when you see those men speaking. And you see them speaking directly to you. It's one of the things about this project that's very interesting. So they're asked to ask a question of someone else within this diverse demographic and they're looking straight out. And so you as a viewer, when you come into contact with the project, you are, in a curious and interesting way, being invited into that space with them, kind of into the community, because you're being spoken to as if you are part of that community. And in, a, you know, in an affective way, that draws you in very powerfully. And there's also a, a, an art exhibit, an installation of this project, where you step in and, and there are monitors around you at head height, and, and, and the men's heads, you know, life size, speaking to you, and it's a very powerful project. Anyway, so question bridge. Um, just a couple of things to say about that. 
This project is very much face to face as well as online and in galleries and there's, a, there's been a road show going on, going to galleries, schools, museums, prisons over the last couple of years. And I think, the, I, I interviewed Kamal Sinclair recently about it. She said, I think she said they have an ambition to reach 20% of black American men and they believe they can do that. Um, and there is research which shows very clearly that intervening around perception, self-perception, can make a real difference in people's lives. So this is not a kind of question of, you know, only about representation. That, that you know, how you feel about yourself impacts on what you feel able to do, what you feel able to hope for, what you feel able to reach for in your life. So, um, so I'll just take one final example, which we're going to hear about much more about this afternoon from Sebastian who's here, who's one of the team behind this remarkable project, Kipu, which is um, still at an early stage in its development, a project which addresses the forced sterilization of indigenous Peruvian men and women in the late 90s, um, uh, a situation which has been to court but not been resolved uh, in, in the favour of the complainants. So, um, so keep with such an interesting question because the women involved are not online. Um, they're not. They've not got access to the internet. They're scattered. They live in remote rural places. And the Kipu team, in this first stage of the project, it's still at an early stage, as, as Sebastian will say, have been thinking really deeply about how to work with that group, respecting both their situations vis-a-vis -vis, you know, technological infrastructure, but also respecting and, and being true to their needs in terms of the, the story. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think it's unfair to say that a traditional 20th century version of documentary on this subject would probably involve, you know, it, with the best m motivations, parachuting in, grabbing this story and leaving, um, you know, and such a documentary would have gone to film festivals and been applauded, but actually, what would it have been for the people involved? What change would it have made for them? And I think what's very interesting about what Shaka Films have done is to think very hard about that and to come up with a solution which respects their technological situation. So there's a kind of, they've used a mix of analog and digital. They've used phone lines as a way of gathering stories. And crucially, they've embedded a, a feedback loop so that the women involved know, not just that they're telling the story, but that they're being heard. Um, so Sebastian, I'll leave it to Sebastian to tell, you, uh, tell us a lot more about that this afternoon, but I think it really kind of changes the kind of paradigm of that kind of grab and run documentary mode that was kind of dominant in the 20th century. So making media available within terms defined by those affected by that story. Um, so... So I'll leave with a quote from Henry Jenkins, who thinks, so yeah, I'll let you read it first. So it's a kind of challenge, a kind of, you know, um, different way of thinking about participation. Thinking about it from the perspective of those taking part, thinking about it from, the, from, the from a political perspective in terms of what it achieves, uh, thinking about the potential for taking part in a documentary project as a potential to, in a sense, move from being an individual to being part of a collective, a public, who are drawing attention to something that, that concerns you. So that, you know, it's all about the agency. Um, so, um, that's me, and I don't know if we have time for questions are now. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Mandy. Very, very, very inspiring. Uh, just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, remember that you have real-time translation. If you need, you have to go out, going on the left side, and you can just bring here some kind of device. So you can just uh, follow now in, in Spanish, during the afternoon in, in English. Okay, so we are turning out. It's time for questions. Uh, we have two mics, one of each side of the room. So I think it's a good moment to uh, question Mandy, very important and key questions in this field. So who is the icebreaker today? Who's gonna break the ice? Someone who have a question for Mandy? Could be in English, in Spanish, whatever, we can translate. Always it's difficult to start. Yes, Monte Carlo, please. Yeah. Hey, First question. Now. Yes, wait for the mic. mic. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, I would like to know uh, how you, you can uh, know or find uh, the end of this kind of projects because they are so, so open and so collaborative. When, when How do you know when you've finished one? Yeah. God, that's a good question. It's that, is a, that is a brilliant question. I think, and I think it's a question for, all, for many of these projects, not just collaborations with people, but for interactive projects in general. Um, and I think it's one which trips many of us up. I have, at the moment, two projects bubbling away, and, um, and I don't know when either of them will end. <laughs> so I'm just saying I think this is the, it's something which absolutely marks this territory as so different from linear documentary making. Um, and I would say I don't know the answer. And I'd be very interested to hear from other speakers during the day what answers they have. But I would urge everyone, as you begin to think about a project, I think, I think Katerina Sizek said something like, you should think you're 50% of your time making the project and 50% after what you think of as the initial production period. I think we all still suffer from this. Well, those of us who have worked in the past in linear documentary, still have this tendency to think about production. We need to think about the life cycle of a project and think about a lot of work that happens after the initial process of making. More questions? I think that you have worked so many years for BBC, making projects like Video Nation or etc. So you have a wider experience in this field. I think Juan has one question, director of Docs Barcelona. So if we can provide him a mic, please, Juan. I would like to know how do you communicate the project in order to make possible that many people participate in it? Because you can work in a room, you can make a participant, a project that many people can participate, but how can you reach the people that you would like to engage in your project, in your project, or in general in the projects? How communicate that and to arrive to the people, to the right people? Um, well, I think that's, the answer is going to be completely different for each project. And so that is about the focus, your, the focus of your project. And I think very often the answer is going to be about sitting down and having a conversation. Um, George Stoney said that every project should end with a handshake or a kiss. And I think that's lovely because I think that, I think it's, you know, I think it's, we shouldn't, um, because there is that potential to reach people virtually, I don't think we should default to that way of working. I think it's a question for each project, who are you trying to talk to and why not go and see them to start with, you know? Um, in fact, I've just done a project, which in, I, the, one of my bubbling projects, the Are You Happy Project, involved me reaching out to filmmakers around the world. And I did that through the D Word, which is a documentary community. Um, so I did do that through um, email, actually. I, what I did was I emailed individuals in different countries and asked them if they'd like to be involved. But I think, so I think one way or another, whether it's face-to-face uh, -face or whether it's online, think about making direct contact. Yeah. 
some other question. Any other questions here? Yeah, there's another one there. Yes, sure. Hello, uh, Mandy. <laughs> eh, la meva pregunta és si existeixen estudis eh, on es vegi ja quin està l'impacte que ha tingut un, un interactiu d'aquest tipus sobre la, la comunitat eh, a la qual ha dirigit. Okay. Uh, I, perdó, I si existeixen on es poden trobar aquests, aquests estudis. Gràcies. She asked if there are some, whether there are studies that measure the incidence or the audience about collaboration models, etc. And in case that these uh, studies existed, where you can find it or who is working on this basis? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, good question. Um, I know that particular projects, I mean, certainly both Question Bridge and Hollow have some work underway that hasn't been published yet. Um, there's a collaboration going on between um, MIT's Open Documentary Lab and Tribeca um, Film Institute, Tribeca New Media. Um, again, not published yet. So, so far, you know, there are things in development. I think it's, I think there's a, a number of us have this sense that this is very important and urgent work. Clearly, the kind of metrics which one can use to measure site visits and, you know, clicks and um, uh, uh, time on particular pages aren't very helpful when it comes to measuring these relationships that are about qualitative relationships. So in a sense, each project needs measuring separately. What I'm interested in doing right now is actually looking at across a number of projects, including some, for example, this Video Nation project we did at BBC Two 20 years ago, um, look, doing some research across a number of projects, asking the same questions and trying to un understand uh, the impact of these projects on individuals and also on communities. Okay, uh, one final thought for you, one final reflection. I want uh, just to have two minutes before we can have to jump to the other. I want to ask you about the, the relationship between the author and the collaborative models. I mean, for a traditional uh, or a documentarist, would be afraid or would feel threatened about opening so much the field in the way that the author cannot control the discourse or the, you know, the script because it's opening to many. So should we create some kind of categories for of collaborative degrees in interactive documentary? What, what do you think? Because your research is on that way, I think, using collab docs or... So the author could be, could feel like, okay, I'm just losing my narrative voice, my arc. What do you think about that? It's obviously quite complicated and I've never got far with a taxonomy of collaboration. Um, there are, you know, different people think about it in different ways from the participants' point of view about intensities of participation. Or um, Nico Carpentier, who's in Belgium, an academic who thinks about these things, thinks about um, minimalist and maximalist participation. So, and actually, I would really urge you to take a look at, I will share it with you all now, and you can share it on. There's a fantastic round table that I read just the other day, including Carpentier, um, Henry Jenkins, Nicola Fe Fence, Fenceman, Fenceman, from the UK, um, uh, about participation, and it's you know, really worth a read. Um, so, but the other question you are asking me is about the author's perspective. And um, I thought of quite a lot about this. Different people have different attitudes to it. I mean, Katerina Sizek is, is fiercely um, clear and fierce about her responsibility as the media maker to shape, to control the whole. The, actually, the best thing she can do for the participants is to have a really clear, you know, creative vision. You know, so I think, I think a lot of this is about transparency. I think, you know, um, and this is something that my colleague John Davey has talked about quite a bit, the importance of developing transparency and protocols around participation so people know exactly what they're getting into. Yeah? Um, uh, so I think, I think it's less a question of surrendering your, your creative um, voice more a question of clarity about your about what you're undertaking. Um, I know 
was something else I was thinking about that. But now I can't remember what it was. So I'll, so I'll leave it there. Yeah. Very, thank you very much, Mandy. A round of applause.